Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, I thought we would have an interesting section where we would talk about fashion. Now, a lot of people, when they think about fashion, they mostly think about clothes and clothes designs. But what about somebody who's able to actually take a look at a person and share with them what exactly works for them to be able to bring out that inner child that we all really long to pull out and share with the world? That sort of confidence that just about anything you decide you want to do and you imagine you can do, you will. On the program today, we're going to be talking with a wonderful guest who has written a marvelous book that basically is a memoir about how she got started in the business and created her own personal niche, something that's very unique that I think a lot of people out there would think, wow, that's a dream come true. The book is I'll Drink to That, and I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program our guest, Betty Halbreich. Betty, how are you doing today? Thank you, Daniel. As I said to you just before the segment began, it's Friday afternoon in New York. <laughs> it's 4.15, and I'll tell you, the vodka is waiting for me at home. I can imagine uh, it would it's, be. <laughs> it's been a rough week. I, uh, the book is, you know, taking me way. I, I'm so sick of talking about me, and I keep talking about me. Mm-hmm. Um this has been a long adventure, as you know from reading the book. Um, 37 years at Bergdorf Goodman. I mean, that's beyond the call anywhere. Uh, when I came, it was a rather stodgy store, and I've had to ride the wave with it because it's gone from a very proper woman's store. No men's at the time when I came here at all. Maybe neckties on the, hidden on the first floor. Uh, to a very sort of trendy, extravagant, I will say, uh, store sitting on the verge of Central Park West, facing the Plaza Hotel. And uh, it's been a long run. Uh, And I know you have questions. Well, no, we actually deal in conversations. I let questions go for journalists. I consider myself a broadcast entertainer. (laughs) That's wonderful. I mean, I'd like to have a little fun on a Friday afternoon. Especially since vodka's waiting around the corner, and you need something to drink, too, right? (laughs) Exactly. Um, You you know, there's more to this just selling situation. Right. Uh, I mean, everybody asks me, how do you size a customer up? How do you do it and whatever? I don't know. At this point in time, I think they're just coming to look at me. I don't think I've turned a nickel in the last week. Everybody sort of picked up the book, which is kind of fun for me. I never dreamt that, you know, people would be even... I think they're interested in the cover. I think that's the whole secret to it. Mm -hmm. And they want to come in and they want to look and they want to see how I process the whole thing. It's a myth. I don't know how I do it. Mm -hmm. I I enjoy it. I reinvent myself probably every day. Mm Mm-hmm. At least I try. I know that wasn't going to be a question I would ever ask you because as I was reading your book, I could feel a real resonance with how I do what I do. And I think what really comes through in your book for those who actually read it is this, is that we are all born with a beautiful, wonderful talent, a gift. We all have this. You know, in this day and age, We get so busy looking outside of ourselves at celebrities and people of high-profile thinking. Absolutely. There's a guy with talent. There's a girl that has something I don't have. I'm going to stay behind the scenes and for the rest of my life remain miserable and perhaps find ways to just numb myself down that I never got that shot that I wanted. And I wanted to kind of put that out there at first because you were also one of those people that had that talent, that drive, you had that gift. And I think that when we get the chance, you know, we find ways to cultivate, to nurture that, however that may work for for each individual, it's very unique, is that if we get that opportunity to get our cup to overflow with it, then it overflows and it reaches out and it touches other people and it allows their candles to be lit that's really what it is you do, and so you can't really explain something like that. Well, but you have to seize the opportunity. Mm-hmm. I was pushed into the opportunity. I've been pushed along and cared for all my life. 
And as my mother said, when I came to work here, I pulled a silver spoon out of my mouth and went to work. Mm -hmm. I was never allowed to work as a young woman. My father was very strange about that. Everybody I knew was offering their services to hospitals and gray ladies, pink ladies, all that nonsense we had in the 50s or the 40s or whatever. And my father said, no, you don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. Everybody I knew took a job at Marshall Fields at that time. It was in, I lived in Chicago. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, was, I was the odd child out. And they didn't realize in wrapping me up in that bunting, I became the loneliest human being in the world. Mm-hmm. It was an only child syndrome. Uh, my parents were I, I don't want to use the word social. Everybody in those days who went to so-and-so's house for dinner, so-and-so had you for dinner, you had them back for dinner, everyone who set the best table, who put out the best food. Uh, they traveled to New York a lot. My father had business here. So I was left pretty much on my own to go through my mother's closets at a very young age. Where this came from I don't know. My mother owned a bookstore later on in life. I mean, she was very literate. My father was a very Phi Beta Kappa from Columbia who went into the fur business because it was his uncle's in Chicago and really wanted to be a banker. So it was all, we all lived sort of conflicting what we wanted to do lives. Um, Much later, in retrospect, I thought about all these things. It didn't help me. I mean, I walked a very fine line, and not knowing who you are for such a long time and being wrapped up, you know, and being made very precious is very damaging. Mm-hmm. But you would say, too, in retrospect, that you began to see and recognize, this is my gift. You loved getting lost in those closets. And see, that's how the mystery unfolds itself in ways that you couldn't imagine. That But a gift... I didn't even know the word. Mine was just, I was wrapped up in that loneliness. I loved mm-hmm. to, to, to pretend I was somebody I wasn't. Mm-hmm. So I think a great deal of it was let's pretend. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't have playmates, I don't know if you have siblings, but if you don't have playmates, you invent them. Or some of us do, let's say that. So I think that's what I was doing. I played many roles in those, putting on my grandmother's negligees and robes and putting, wrapping my mother, my father, bringing home furs and whatever and wrapping myself up in my mother's furs. And uh, it, was a, it was a lonely fantasy life. Mm-hmm. Now, Betty, when it comes to clothing, certainly as somebody reads I'll Drink to That, they'll begin to realize that it's more than just fabrics and designs that these take on personalities of their own. And exactly. as a personality, you know, it becomes alive. And because it becomes alive, liveliness should be nurtured and loved. So you considered yourself someone who sort of found a way, as one designer put it, that became a very good friend of yours. I'm the one that fashions and designs the clothes, and you're the one that finds a place for these clothes to go. Exactly, but I am also extremely particular about what I sell. Mm-hmm. Not to whom. But I, you didn't I, consider yourself a salesperson either, though. Ah, uh, didn't I? I really knew that I was. Right. I didn't want to be, because that meant to me that I was sort of a commission lady, which most salespersons work, and I I fought that, and I won. So when I started here, I did not work on a commission. I worked on a straight salary, as I still do, which mm-hmm. frees the port for me. Mm-hmm. There are days I don't sell anything, but I'm always offering up advice. I'm either sometimes a priest, sometimes a rabbi. I've been through all religions. <laughs> and I, it gives Fashion me... Fashion knows no bounds, doesn't that it? That is correct. <laughs> oh, dear God. But at least I... Offering something, Mm -hmm. and offering something without charging. Mm -hmm. You know, my services have never been charged. I would abhor that. I wouldn't have stayed here five minutes Mm -hmm. if somebody had put a tax on me or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, you pretty much 
sort of invented your particular position there at the store, didn't you? Did what? Invented your particular position at the store that you work at, didn't you? Well, the department really didn't exist, so to speak, and they, you know, Mr. Namath came to you and said, "Hey, you know what can what can you do for us?" I oh, guess. Mr. Neymark, yeah. oh my God, mm-hmm. yes, he really didn't know. He scratched his head, but they scratched their head from the day they I entered here for an interview. They mm-hmm. kept vaulting me from person to person. I went from vice president to president to the head of whatever of uh, Mr. Goodman himself. Oh, and lovely. You're just lovely. You dress so well, blah, blah, blah. What are we going to do with you? In other words, I came with maybe capabilities that somebody else saw, but no resume, none. I've never had a resume. I've never had to look for a job. They've all sort of fallen in, as I said, at cocktail parties. I've repeated this over and over again, that most of my jobs or whatever they are have all come when I'm at a cocktail party. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's it's been, uh, you know, if I sit back and start to evaluate this life, which I do not do, incidentally, my worry is what am I going to do tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Now that sounds sort of sacrimonious, but it's the truth. I looked on my, my calendar. I've turned the page to Monday. And that's what so many women my age, for God's sakes, I mean, you know, people just shake their head when they hear how old I am. I'm going to be 87 in November. I mean, it's very difficult for me to to realize, you know, that I might trip and fall over in my soup one day and not make it to work. I'm going to leave a lot of loose ends here. Mm-hmm. But it's a fact of life. And there are a lot of people like me, but there aren't a lot of people working like me. And it's not a driven feeling. It's a place to go. It's a place to come. It's a place to give. There's nothing wrong with selling a little bit and making somebody happy and feel good. Now, isn't it amazing to you that at my age, I can still take care of 20-year-olds, 22-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14-year-olds, besides the 60-year-olds and all the way up? Mm -hmm. I don't have people my age that I'm taking care of. I think what's wonderful, too, for the listeners to note is the fact that, you know, retirement doesn't sound like something you would ever do because as you were describing uh, in the book, is that this is your safe haven. This is a place where you know you can count on certainty in particular ways. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm beyond retirement age. You realize that? (laughs) I mean, if I tell somebody on the phone, if I'm calling social services or calling somebody about my unemployment or employment or whatever that nonsense you have to do periodically... They say, what? You're still working? They must think I'm a monster with two heads. Hmm. You know, a young head and an old head. Um, I don't really think about it. I only think about it when I'm speaking to you or someone in the media or whatever. It, It never comes up. It never has come up among my clients. No one's ever questioned that. I don't want to hear I'm remarkable. I'm really not remarkable. I'm just standing on my two feet, and as long as I can do this, how lucky am I? I think what you just said there is why people think you're remarkable. Uh, Remarkable is a very big word. You know, the Pope is remarkable. (laughs) Obama was remarkable. I mean, you know, let's, let's talk about real people, not about Betty Halbreich. I am, and your listeners, I hope they laugh at this, I am so tired about talking about Betty Halbreich that I don't even know who she is anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, this this is a journey that I never expected. Uh, I did this book in longhand myself. Rebecca tweaked it, and we did it tweaking together. But I have that whole book written down on a legal pad that I worked on for a year, and it was the grand catharsis. It cleansed my soul. 
I could have written more. I didn't to save the people that are related to me that are still in bewilderment about it, my two children. And my, I think my grandchildren understand it better than my children. Mm-hmm. And why do you think that is? I question them and I get, Mom, I hear your voice from my daughter. And my son said, I finished it. Now you go analyze that. <laughs> it doesn't say very much, does it? Mm-hmm. You know, my grandchildren are proud of me, but they can read whatever they want. My children are part of it. So I'm not going any further with that because I'm not going to analyze it. I don't blame you. You get to a <laughs> point in life, you say, what the hell? Why do I even want to bother? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I went back home to Chicago. Isn't that terrible? Freudian slip. I did go back home to Chicago this past week and spoke to a group at the Arts Club in Chicago. I still consider Chicago my hometown. I'm still a Midwesterner. I've lived here since 1947. So I think I'm not completely healed in the head altogether if I still say I'm going home again. And a friend of mine literally dragged out what was left of the living that I went to school with. So that was one of the most gratifying things to look to eyeball these people that I would never have recognized, nor they me, but it felt good. You know, it was it, it, that was a real, that was like someone giving me a diamond bracelet. And I don't even like diamond bracelets. <laughs> but you did like pairing up jewelry. Yes, I do like jewelry. <laughs> but I don't love jewelry. Don't you understand, when you're young, and especially if you're, you're the want, want more child and the want more wife, that just fills in a lot of niches for the unhappiness that really exists. You know, that's a gratification that I try to explain to the people that come to me who keep wanting more brought to them and more brought to them. I call a halt. I I am not instant gratification. No. No. I know what that feels like. And it only lasts until you get home. You say that you've had people that come in, too, that tend to feel these are needs. And you really clarify that by saying, no, these are wants. You need to breathe. You need to eat. And if you get tired, you need to sleep. Anything after that is extra, it sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, people get caught up. You know, it's like you go to a grocery store. And you see that the apples have just arrived. Okay, you take too many apples, and then you go to the peaches, and then you go to the pears, and you say to yourself, now, I don't want to fill this basket today. But before you know it, it's so easy to put your hand up to that shelf and just take. You get home, and you wonder what you bought. You haven't bought it with rhyme or reason. You haven't taken a list, so you don't know what's in that cart. And it's usually too much. The same thing with buying a clothing. You get, become carried away. I'll send it home. I'll try it. If I don't like it, if my husband doesn't like it, if my children says that's terrible, I'll ask my mother-in-law to come over. My, you know, It goes on and on and on. I don't like that kind of buying, and I don't sell that way. And I just Now, the people that come to buy generally don't need to clothe themselves. They don't, they don't walk in here nude and say, I need clothing until I go back out into the street again. So I have to call either a halt to it very often, or I say, you really don't need it, or do you remember you have something like it, or can we wait and try till the next time? I try all sorts of avenues to make a nice tea. You know, tight package. I want to see these people again. I -hmm. want longevity in my office. I don't want one-shot deals. Mm -hmm. Well, it's what you said in your book is this. When you come to me and you decide to work with me, we become married. And you have a lot of spouses out there. 
Oh, do I ever. <laughs> oh, do I. And do See, I and have a lot of, how... do I have, you know, that's a whole book unto itself that I could never write. Right. I have some temperaments that you not would not believe, some dispositions <laughs> that you would not believe, some stories that are unbelievable that I cannot divulge, nor would I ever, but I sometimes giggle at night, and I know what to expect when the phone rings and they make an appointment. Mm-hmm. I know what's coming in. It it's it's it would make a wonderful play, actually. It would could be staged in real life and really be a hoot. You know, well, why take sto- yourself so seriously about clothing? You know, mm-hmm. why do people? You know, I've wondered that myself, you know, and as you read in in your book I'll drink to that you have a very eloquent way of speaking about designs, designers, what cups. So, I mean, it was out of my league. I'm not somebody who knows fashion. I'm a guy, you know. You put of on course. clothes for its practicality. But when I read what you wrote, I find myself romantically tangling in a world that says, no, come in and, and allow us to invite you to this dance here. It isn't that hard. It's not that complicated. Just dance, and it was just like listening to a French sommelier, you know, describing huh. wine. How about says, the wine? Exactly. Wouldn't you know, I have been a good sommelier? I, I no, no doubt about it. <laughs> <laughs> there I, I kept thinking, especially when you open the book in your first chapter, and I say, you know, I, I totally forgot that we were going to be learning about or at least reading about fashion design and clothing because – you were describing the aromas and the types of food in the kitchen being prepared oh, by no the idea. house staff and, and no and I just and I got it having worked in restaurants years ago and I thought and then all of a sudden, you know, then we're into you trying on clothes, hiding out in the closet, experimenting with different things and I thought but the kitchen is my first love. It is. It still is. I could tell. <laughs> it still is. And somebody emailed me the other day no someone in chicago at the lunch said a man oh betty i remember those egg timbles when we were kids everybody else looked around and said timbles that sounds like a screwdriver now here's a man that we went together we were together in second grade who still remembers egg timbles as i've told everyone saturday is my grocery store day if my fridge is not full not full, but neat. I'm a neat Nick. I, I'm, that's why I'm glad I live alone. I could never remarry. No man would live with me. I am so precisely neat. It's lined up like you could take a photo. But that refrigerator is going to be filled tomorrow, and I'm going to cook on Sunday to so take care of my needs over the week. Now, I'm not home every week, but you could always come to my house for dinner. I like going out and shopping daily when it comes to dinner. <laughs> Good for you. At least you have the time element. <laughs> I'm here at 8.30 in the morning, mm-hmm. and I leave at 5.30 at night. I don't like shopping at 5.30. Everyone's pinched the peaches. Everyone's looked at the tomatoes. Everything looks sad and tired. Mm. Well, I suppose that also depends on where you go as well, right? You live in a different city. Absolutely. <laughs> this city is A and P city. <laughs> and every and takeout, may I add, nobody I, cooks here anymore. I think what's really important for our listeners out there to know about your story is that you really love living in service to others. And that service includes a multitude of things that you provide above and beyond just saying I believe this coat will work very, very well for you. Describe the importance of something like that, of service, because I think we hear so much today about we're customer service driven. We're their number one. You're the number one priority. It doesn't exist. You're not seeing it. Never. No, it doesn't exist. That's a phony, put it in the newspaper, advertise it, ridiculous. It doesn't exist. And I see the young people even that sell here, and they're trained, and they're good. But remember, if you're working on a commission basis, you're paying your rent by that coat you're selling how many coats. I have, again, the freedom of the port. If I don't like something on somebody, 
look, I'm I'm not always 100% right. But I've been here so many years that I do really know, I hope, I hope, quality. I've seen it diminish, but I have to live with what I've given. I know how something should fit. I know how to alter something. And if you don't look good in it, I can't send you out in it. Mm-hmm. I just cannot do it. It is a, I was God gave me a good eye, and that eye sees things that even some of the fitters don't see. I some of them don't like working with me. I can tell you, mm-hmm. but those that do know that we can put something together and make someone look good. You know, people are really misfits. There are very few good bodies in the world. It's not like you see in the magazines or the newspapers or on the the silver screen. You know, people are dumpy, they're heavy, they're, what can I tell you? I mean, God made us all, you know, different and yet all the same. Mm -hmm. I remember it was some years ago, there was a, I guess, a a jean sale going on at a convention center. I thought, well, that's unusual. They're selling jeans at a convention center, and I thought, I would go down and take a look at this because I'd never heard anything like this before. And what I was astounded by, first of all, were all the name brands of jeans. I'm somebody who knows Levi's and Wrangler, for instance. That's all I know. You know, but here were all these names of jeans and all these girls, and they're just scouring through thousands of pairs of these. Unbelievable. I think there were two or three full rooms of these, and... And I couldn't get it, and I finally decided I just had to ask someone, and not somebody that worked in one of these rooms, but one of the shoppers, what is it with these labels and all these jeans? And she said something really interesting that I would have never thought of. She says, do you know how hard it is to find something that is a good fit? And I never actually thought about clothes like that before. Well, have you seen a lot of those poor fits on those people? Right, exactly. I walk behind them every day to work. (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of poor fits walking around, and that's my obsession. I I have told those that have asked, I have never, ever in my 86 years worn a pair of jeans. Mm -hmm. As my mother said, if everybody's wearing jeans, Betty won't wear jeans. That's where I walk to a different drummer. If the world is wearing pink, I wear black. If the world is wearing black, I'll wear checks. And that's how I dress my people. Mm-hmm. Just a little step up. But when it comes to, to jeans, I won't touch them. Mm-hmm. I say to go somewhere else. And we have a whole floor of jeans. I just look at them like they're my enemy. Now, because you are tired of talking about Betty Halbreich, yes, why don't we talk about Gerald Ford? <laughs> oh, he was the most. That was a cute story, by the way. Hmm? <laughs> that was a cute story you shared in there but because you were actually you, working with his wife. He was mm-hmm. the gentlest, most attractive, extremely tall Midwesterner that I have ever really attended. And we had the best time. That's what happens to me, you see. It doesn't matter who you are. I mean, I've had princesses in here. And I'll tell you something. If you ask me their names, I couldn't even tell you because I never remember. That, you know, uh, he was the dearest man, and he she was not well at the time. And he took such loving care of her. That it, I don't know husbands and wives. There are not many in my lifetime that I've seen such deep affection. And this was really a nice man. He was nice to the men that were waiting for him. He was nice to us in the office. And this wasn't a sham. This man made himself extremely comfortable in here for over an hour and a half. Mm-hmm. That was one of the highlights of my life. Mm-hmm. I really, I thought he was the most misunderstood president nobody gave mr ford a chance Mm -hmm. no so but you can tell i unfortunately i'm a republican which will probably kill a lot of sales in the book oh well republicans (laughs) are just like the rest of us just like you said in the book i eat with a fork 
and a knife the same way you do. Exactly. <laughs> Don't you like and that? And you have no tolerance for snobbery. You know, just recently we had on the program a wine sommelier, and she was somebody that that was a business she was interested in getting into, and she started out in Chicago of all places. And we had such a fun time about this because we had the same attitudes about people who get themselves to that level of knowing something so well they feel they're above humanity. Like it's a privilege that a you're huge, even in their realm to hear huge, what they have to say. And, and you're not like that at that's all. That's a huge insecurity underneath that. Mm-hmm. I've had enough psychiatry to tell you that. <laughs> Believe me, that's, that's as insecure as you can be. Mm-hmm. You know, I am, and who is I am? I said to someone the other day, you know, Halbrush is a very difficult name. I've been trying to get rid of it for years, but I have to forget because I've been stuck with it since 1947. Mm-hmm. But now everyone says to me, I walk through the store, and I'm carrying these clothes and these hangers, and I, I have real hanger rot on my hands. And they say to me, are you Betty? So now I've coined it, and I now it's R, period, just a U, and Betty. That's my entire name. I like it. <laughs> Keep it simple. In my na- I better tell my accountant that, right? <laughs> and the IRS as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was going to elaborate real quickly, though, about the story about Gerald Ford I thought was really funny because it was just so cute because as you handed him the dress, he sort of tucks it under his arm, just like he was a running back Could at Michigan killed him. State. Exactly. And then you turned around and you said, excuse me, this is what you do here. And he kind of smiles and he turns to his Secret Service agent and says, look, she taught me how to carry my first dress. Exactly. <laughs> it was the cutest story. And it did come out right. And it was as exactly as you've told it is exactly how it happened. And it really impregnated my brain. Now, a lot of people have come through here. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. And I remember them. You know, when people question me, I never discuss that. It's not my place to. Mm-hmm. You know, some of them are gone. Some of them come and go. Some of them return. Some of them have big names. So what? Mm-hmm. You know, in the scheme of things, that's not what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to give back. Mm -hmm. I want to give back these, you know, something that I've learned in this, these 37 years. Mm -hmm. They've really been good to me. Mm -hmm. Good to me. I think what's fascinating, too, is uh, it was probably about six months ago. I, I love going to the library and sometimes scanning the movie section. I don't even go to places like... Oh, that movie! Yeah, Blockbuster, anything like that. Oh, my goodness. And what I found or came across was a documentary on Valentino. Mm -hmm. And uh, one question I wanted to ask, had you ever actually met Valentino? Yes. Okay. I met him when I really didn't recognize him because the poor soul was so overly plastered together that it was like looking at something that wasn't alive. Okay. Yes. I did meet him in the store at one time. And uh, he was gracious, generously gracious. You know, they all pass through here. They're all absolutely enamored with this store because mm-hmm. it's very beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's not large in the scheme of things. Have you ever been here? No, I haven't. But you see, you wouldn't feel like you're in a huge Macy's or a huge Nordstrom's or whatever. It's a small collection of buildings that were put together to make a store. So it still has some of that architectural charm that's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And the reason I wanted to bring him up, it, it was fascinating to watch this documentary about his life as oh, yes. a fashion designer. And what was even more fascinating was the turn of events in the industry itself. There was a time, and you and you talk about this so well in the book, about personal service, individuality, you know, that it was really one-on-one, and that's how his designs and a lot of designers were because you started in the business around the time a lot of these people were beginning to grow and flourish. Well, but I, then he describes, or they describe in the documentary, not all he does a little bit, is that but fashion has changed so much where an idea or concept becomes tangible, and then they turn it into a mass market. 
and lost are the people that actually get an opportunity to be served and to feel the uniqueness about being who they are is. But they turned that market into a mass market and took the couture out of the couture Mm -hmm. for one word, and it's called money. Mm -hmm. They couldn't make the money that they did in couture like they do in mass market. And mass market's an overused word. I mean, we still sell Valentino. It's extraordinary, luxurious. It's bought very piece by piece, and it's very expensive. Mm-hmm. And maybe it would be called mass market today because couture was made for individual women, where you would go in for three or four fittings, and they had a department like that when I came. It started to look old. It wasn't what was coming. It wasn't what was going to be. You know, everybody's on the run. Remember, in those days, women didn't work like they do today. A woman today works and still has to dress. The young lawyers, the young stockbrokers, the whatever, some still wear T-shirts and those blue jeans that they find at convention centers. But when women had all the time in the world. I was one of them. You know, you'd go out and shop, go have lunch at Lord & Taylor. The children were taken care of by a nursemaid. Those were different days. That doesn't exist today in the majority, of the majority of human beings that I know. Everyone is very busy. And even if they don't have true jobs, they make themselves busy. Mm -hmm. Charity work, all sorts of things that women do. Most of the women I take care of all belong to something, or they work. That's the admirable part. Take away the cell phone and the computer and whatever, because I'd burn them if I could to get back to a bit of reality. I think you understand what I'm saying. I don't own a cell phone, and I do understand what you're saying. Nor do I. (laughs) Nor do I. Oh I think my. we're the only two people in America. <laughs> no, I do not my wife own one. doesn't own one either. <laughs> you, the three of us don't have one. I don't use a computer. Mm-hmm. And I have a cell phone looking at me that they keep upgrading me on cell phones. I don't know why they're upgrading me. It's never been taken out of the store. No. I, I, wanna see, I don't want to see my face in that phone when I go home on the bus tonight every age group, whenever, poking at that phone. And and I find it so rude. And that sounds like an old lady, and I don't care. It's just plain rude. Well, I've shut many a conversation down just for that reason where you have someone in a group of people on a cell phone deciding they have to be the center of conversation And finally, you can see people just becoming irritated by the whole thing because they don't want to hear it either. But nobody wants to step up and say, would you shut up? Oh, you (laughs) should see the I'm sorry, but I'm just one of those that says, will you shut up? Well, you see, I had to talk loud because the person on the other end is hard of hearing. Well, then go have lunch with them, would you? I mean, I do this in the elevator all day long. I throw looks that will kill because, you see, people get in now. Pick up that cell phone so they don't have to eyeball you. You see, it's a cop-out. It's, I watch this every day. They walk in and that phone's picked up so they don't have to make contact with anyone. They don't have to smile. They, don't have, they can just stick their nose in that expensive phone. And good luck to them. Because I, I wouldn't like them anyway. Now, Betty, I have to ask you this. Since we're on this subject, it makes a lot of sense to... How have you seen, as you have served people over the years, the scape, I guess, as far as people? Has it changed in the way that, does it seem that it takes a little longer to work with someone new or, you know, versus maybe the Because of my age table? or my agility? No, 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 I'm talking more of the generations. We're talking about people, for instance, there was a time you could go into an elevator, as we were talking about, and even though a person might be someone you've never met, you have a few floors to go, you might say, how are you doing today, or that looks nice. You, you might connect with them just for that short ride. No, they connect but, with me. But what I'm saying is, and then you describe how 
They're burying their faces. Nobody wants to actually look at you, so the cell phone becomes sort of a security blanket. Have you seen that kind of happen as people come to you fresh and new versus, say, 20 years ago? No. Is that it takes I, a little I, longer to break the ice, or no, is it pretty much always been the same? No, absolutely not. Okay. Because they want to come here. Okay. You see, they want to be taken. I'm not out looking for them. That's what, you know, that's the difference. I'm not out searching for anybody. I've never called a client, you know, and sought out there and say, why don't you, when I have this for you, or come in, I have a beautiful coat. I, I have never done that. I've had people say to me, why don't you call me, and I'd come in. I haven't got the time to do that. You know, my life is too full with other things to sit there and ponder if Mrs. Jones would look good in that jacket or something. No, 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 no. I keep a soft contact with them. How are the children? How was the wedding? How was the trip? That's as far as I go. I never offer up. I have a beautiful handbag. You need a new pair of shoes. Nobody needs, and certainly no one needs for me. So it's a very soft. Maybe somebody in the business would say, oh, God, that's soft sell. Maybe. I don't know. But that's how I work. And I don't, I've never had to do it, just like I've never, as I repeat, had to look for a job. I've never had to look for a client. I don't know. It's just sort of, I don't know. <laughs> and you've never had to take your driver's test either. No, I have a driver's. No, 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 no. I did take a driver's test. Oh, you license, did? Okay. I just and remember. I passed it on the first time and never drove again. Okay. I guess that's how I was That goes right it. with the cell phone. <laughs> I've had people chauffeur me all my life. Mm. Isn't that awful? You know, you learn to live by your wits when you don't do things like this. Mm-hmm. You know, as a friend of mine says, I was late for dinner. The I wanted to be late to meet you at the restaurant, but you don't have a cell phone. How am I going to get a hold of you? I said, how would you get a hold of me 20 years ago? I'll be at the restaurant. You'll be late, and I'll wait for you. You understand what I'm saying, I think, very well. Absolutely. And I know <laughs> that the listeners out there are going to find... Uh... They must be scratching their heads. No, they're not scratching their heads. You know, like you said in the beginning, and I agree, there are times I like my guests to come on and just not talk about themselves. Well, <laughs> Especially I after what you've been through. I know how, how grueling that can be out oh, there answering the grueling, same questions. But you know, everything has an end. You know, you get up to that top of that tree, and we have nowhere to go but down. Mm. So I, I know exactly how this is going to play out. And then it'll be Christmas. Absolutely. You know, it'll be something else. And you keep reinventing it. Well, Betty, I want to thank you for joining us here on the program today. I'll well, it to was that. delightful. Mm-hmm. I must say I thank you for having me. Absolutely. You really ended my sort of so-so day on a very high note. Well, I like to be in service, too. I may not know clothing like you do and oh, I people hope that not. way, but I know that when I listen to a voice and I hear how it's communicating to itself, this is the way it's going to go, and I'm going to allow that to happen. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. And besides, it was kind of nice to get away from talking about sex in the city for a change, wasn't oh, it? Oh, <laughs> you better believe it. And she's still alive, and she's wonderful, and it's a whole other thing, and to talk about something other than the same old things. Mm-hmm. So, absolutely, I thank you again. It was very generous of you. Thank you very much for being on the program, and they can read those stories in the book anyway. It's there. Yeah, sure can. So you go out and you go get it because, like Betty, I don't go to anybody. I let them come to me. <laughs> thank you for understanding. I think you're a good psychiatrist. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Again, the book is I'll Drink to That. I think you're going to find some marvelous stories and understand what it means to get back to the idea of not only connecting but also being in service as well. Wonderful read. I'm Daniel Davis. I want to thank you for tuning in. You can find out more about us. Visit us at beyond50radio.com, the number 50. Thank you again for tuning in, and remember, live your day past halfway.